Fun fact, I own this lab coat because every Halloween I dress up as the same thing. The doctor my parents wish I was. Eesh. Inside Job is a Netflix cartoon created by Shion Takeuchi, a writer and animator best known for her work on Gravity Falls and Disenchantment. The series is a workplace comedy about shadow government employees who oversee and maintain deep state cover-ups for a company called Cognito Inc. Members of the main cast include Reagan, a genius but socially inept engineer, Gigi, a fast-talking social media guru, Glenn, a jingoistic human dolphin super soldier, Mike, a psychic mushroom from Hollow Earth, Andre, a perpetually stoned biochemist, and Brett, a happy-go-lucky yes-man who's essentially the human version of a golden retriever. I stay awake at night because I don't even know what my favorite color is, and I'm afraid I don't have a real personality. This show is hilarious. The jokes are incisive and witty, often commenting on larger issues like sexism in the workplace and systemic societal failures. Boo! I've seen better science in a Louisiana textbook! It's funny because it's true. <laughs> Inside Job is a difficult show to discuss, thanks in no small part to the fact that it's an incomplete thought. The show's impromptu cancellation was particularly painful because in June of 2022, a second season was ordered. But in January of 2023, Netflix retracted that renewal. The 18 episodes we got are still engaging and entertaining, but there's an underlying thread of untapped potential that's hard to ignore. Inside Job is also difficult to discuss in a literal sense. Summarizing the plot of any given episode is a Herculean task, and the subject of conspiracy theories is a delicate matter. On the one hand, the moon landing and JFK's assassination are fun topics to explore. On the other hand, the idea that a race of reptilian humanoids secretly controls the world is a notion that's deeply rooted in anti-Semitic tropes. That's not to say that Inside Job is malicious in its portrayal of these issues. Rather, it's important that we as audience members understand the more harmful implications of crackpot rhetoric. To quote Dan Olson, the end goal of conspiratorial beliefs is to simplify reality by attributing the high chaos state of the world to a singular active force or group opposed by an equally singular solution. At its core, the impulse to make reality easier to digest is sympathetic. The universe is inherently nonsensical, and in the absence of clear answers, people will start accepting the wrong explanations. Most conspiracies are just capitalism. This understanding of conspiracists applies to more than just flat earthers or proponents of the stone date theory. Everyone asks open-ended and ambiguous questions. Why did my partner leave me? Why were my high school bullies so unnecessarily cruel? Why can't my parents be what I need them to be? When faced with a perpetual fill-in-the-blank scenario, our imaginations tend to run wild. We're all guilty of constructing false narratives in our heads because we want to decipher the quagmires of existence and in interpersonal relationships. To be human is to be a conspiracy theorist. And no one understands this better than Reagan Ridley. Do you ever have those mornings where you start pulling at the mental thread that your entire life could be different if maybe you hadn't been raised by such an asshole? Reagan's relationship with her father is one of the show's core storylines. Rand is an abrasive, self-serving asshole with a severe case of alcoholism and a crippling inability to cope with the end of his 35-year-long marriage. Reagan has a front row seat to this living train wreck because Rand moves in with her at the start of the series. The once esteemed co-founder of Cognito Inc. was forced into an early retirement after his reckless antics almost exposed the deep state. Dad, you weren't pushed out. You were fired for getting drunk and trying to blow up the sun. I was gonna cure skin cancer! His shortcomings as a father extend far beyond simply depriving his daughter of affection. Reagan subconsciously adopted Rand's conspiratorial way of thinking. When confronted with a situation that doesn't make sense, her first impulse is to fall down a rabbit hole of irrationality. She assumes Brett has nefarious intentions when he's hired as teen co-leader. She invents a pair of robotic arms to avoid addressing her aversion to physical touch. And the metaphysical manifestation of her mind is organized like a conspiracy board. Even in my brain, I'm a paranoid maniac who shops at Michael's. Everyone is shaped by their parents, be it intentionally or unintentionally. But in Reagan's case, this truth is far more literal than you would think. Rand molded his daughter into the perfect successor in more ways than one. You got half your mother's genes and half blessed with mine. Actually, I tweaked your DNA in the womb, so it's more like 60-40. In episode 10, it's revealed that he altered Reagan's memories by erasing and rewriting every interaction she ever had with her childhood best friend, Oren, to quote-unquote, save her from a life of middling achievement, and to ensure that daddy's little insurance policy doesn't get off track by befriending some idiot. This further isolated Reagan from her peers and exacerbated the fiction that the two of them were misunderstood geniuses who only had each other. Hey there, Jellybean. Who's your best friend in the whole wide world? Uh, I don't know. You? After this revelation, Reagan kicks Rand out of both her apartment and her life, only for Rand to maneuver his way back to the top of Cognito Inc. as its newly reinstated CEO. 
To say that this development destroys Reagan's psyche is a bit of an understatement. Oh, so this is what rock bottom looks like. More tropical than I thought. Following a failed coup, Brett refers Reagan to Anon Anon, a support group for fellow Secret Society employees. And it's here where she meets Ron Stadler, a mind eraser who works for the Illuminati. Shadow government is just as dumb as the regular government. It's, it's just, just assholes, assholes all, all the way, way down. down. Now, this might be my hottest take from the entire series, but I can't stand this guy. Watching his romance with Reagan develop is like watching a dear friend fall in love. You're happy that they're in a fulfilling, committed relationship, but spending time with their significant other is kind of a total chore. What do you mean that's an overly specific example? Ron's not a bad dude, I just think that his self-aware state of detached irony is insufferable. And his martyr complex is tedious to say the least. The episode that explores his lingering Catholic guilt is funny, but I never really got invested in his character. Hey, look at you mixing business with pleasure. Yeah, I'll call it Biz Leisure, working title. Actually, I feel good about it, let's lock it in. Despite my complaints, Ron still plays a crucial role in Reagan's development. He's essentially the male version of her, so their relationship is almost a form of self-love, something Reagan definitely lacks for most of the series. Her willingness to let him go in the final episode demonstrates an unprecedented level of growth and maturity. Two people can love each other dearly and still not end up together because they ultimately don't share the same priorities. Ron's job is a never-ending strain on his mental health, but Reagan finds gratification in her work. She would never feel content with a simpler life in Appleton, so she prioritizes Ron's happiness over her own selfish desire to quote-unquote have it all. And as long as the person you love is happy, maybe you can be happy later. This choice definitively punctuates the difference between Reagan and her father. In the penultimate episode, Rand relaunches Project Reboot, a reality-altering device that threatens to destroy the world. Everyone assumes this reckless decision is fueled by Rand's desperate need to keep his job, but when Reagan finally tracks him down, she discovers an old man weary from a mind more filled with memory than it is with hope. That's how many times I tried to get you both back, you and your mother, into the same timeline, but it never works, Reagan. No matter how many times I try, you both hate me. The idea that our parents are untouchable, godlike beings is a conspiracy theory almost everyone has subscribed to at some point. For nearly 30 years, Reagan thought her dad was an extraordinary figure, but that's just not true. Rand is merely a flawed man who failed as a father, and his refusal to let things go nearly destroys the world. I spent my whole life thinking you were a hero or a villain, but you're not. You're just my dad, the screw up. There's nothing more sobering than the realization that your parents are fellow human beings. Once you free yourself from the pitfalls of toxic attachments, you can reclaim your own narrative and shape it into whatever you choose it to be. Reagan accepts the promotion at Cognito Inc. because she genuinely believes she can make the world a better place. Unfortunately, we'll never get to see if she succeeds or not. Inside Job wasn't perfect, but the show deserved the chance to develop into something greater than the sum of its parts, which is becoming a frustrating trend in the streaming age. Imagine if we only got one season of Buffy or BoJack. Think about all the beautiful episodes that wouldn't exist because a network decided to cut these programs off at the knees. Creative and clever shows are constantly getting canceled despite their apparent success, and we the audience members are left to theorize why they got axed. I don't have a powerful affirmation or a piece of wisdom to offer here. I'm just tired of getting invested in stories that aren't given the chance to flourish. Who knows? Maybe Inside Job got seven seasons in a spinoff in the Berenstein universe. Look, Christian bears aside, is this gonna make us any money? 